والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم صلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are discussing the battle of Uhud one of the greatest battles of Islam It happened on the third year of Hijrah one year after the defeat of the polytheists the idol worshippers on the battle of Badr. Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet والسلام, sent to his nephew the inside information that the people of Quraysh are coming to invade Medina. They were coming with an army of 3,000 men, 200 riders on horseback, and 700 armed warriors in armor, full armor. The Prophet ﷺ tried to mobilize his army, and everybody was keen and eager to fight. But they were outnumbered, because by nature, there, were, there weren't a lot of Muslims at the time. So the Prophet ﷺ prayed Friday prayer, and that was in the month of Shawwal. The Prophet ﷺ prayed Friday prayer, and he encouraged people to fight in the cause of Allah. He prayed Asr prayer and set out with his army to the battlefield. And they camped between an area, in an area between Medina and the mountain of Uhud. In an area called Al-Shaykhain, the Prophet ﷺ started looking at his men and allowing those who were capable of fighting to fight and rejecting those who were young. And he returned back about 14 of the companions because they were below 15 years old. Among them was Abdullah ibn Umar. Usama ibn Zayd, Al-Bara ibn Azib, and also Zayd ibn Thabit, one of the great scholars of Islam and one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ, simply because they were underaged. He allowed only Rafi' uh, 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 ibn Khadij, may Allah be pleased with him. Though he was 14, he allowed him in the army because he was an excellent archer. Samura ibn Jundub, who was also a companion, who was also 14, objected. He said, how do you reject me and accept Rafa while I am stronger than he is? I'm better in the battlefield than he is. And the funny thing was, at first, when the Prophet ﷺ rejected Samura, he burst into tears. He cried. Like a, like, a, like a child, like a baby, 14 years old. He wants to go to fight. Subhanallah. It's not a game. Yet these boys were men. They knew what fighting meant. They knew the implication of their actions. Nevertheless, they wanted to die in the cause of Allah. So when he saw Rafi being admitted to the army, he objected to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet asked him, are you able to pin him down to the ground if you wrestle with him? He said, give me seconds. So he told him, okay, go. Let me see what you do. And in a matter of seconds, 
Rafi' was on the, fro on the ground and Samura was pinning him down. So the Prophet ﷺ accepted him and admitted him to the army. Now the, the, the issue would be, is, is this ethical in today's standards? In the sense, is it okay for children to fight in wars? So they say. And they have these special courts, especially in Africa and in and, and, and Sierra Leone and so on, where they court-martial or whatever, those who admit children into wars. Well, I don't know what the, what the rules are according to the European or the, to the Geneva Conventions. Conventions, but it's it all different from different societies like we have in Palestine. The youth are more stronger than the men in most places in the world because their, their, their beliefs or their culture is is a culture of you know maturity at a young age. While in the West or other places, the youth they play with uh, computers and and the, the mindset is different. So and, um, I believe, I like how you mentioned before about how uh, the strength of the companions and uh, how big they were, how strong they were, to a level like you know unbelievable that could happen these days. Like it could give me myself a hint, like they were really strong, that their children could beat like strong men at the moment. Okay, mm. the criteria that we should judge things over is not what they think it's what the Quran and the Sunnah tell us and that is why they say beyond or below 18 years of age a woman cannot marry she's underage they say if she's over 18 and she has intimate relationship this is with her uh, concession that's okay in Islam it's adultery fornication is not forbidden and is not permissible in Islam. They say if this took place before she was 18, this is considered to be rape. Though she conceded, but because she is underage. Likewise, if a person kills before he is 16 or 18 years old, he's not executed, where execution is practiced because he's underage. They claim that if a 16 or 15 years old does something, this is negligible because he's a teenager. So it's okay for him to do things that are not okay for others, adults. In Islam, it's completely different. In Islam, a person is accounted for his actions if he reaches the age of puberty. And the age of puberty is recognized by few things among them is reaching the age of 15 he could reach the age of puberty before 15 depending if he has a nocturnal emission or so on or if he has grown hair in the pubic area and uh, and, and elsewhere as the, the jurors say the fuqaha say so 15 was the ceiling whoever was 15 and above is an adult and that is why the Prophet ﷺ would not have children fighting, fighting in his side, but Rafi and Samura were adults. They had reached the age of puberty, but they were below 15. And this is how we judge on things, not on their conventions, not on their rules, because their rules allow same-sex marriages. And no way in Islam this is acceptable. Homosexuality is not acceptable in Islam. So we judge things through the spectrum of the Quran and the Sunnah, not through their eyes. Abdullah? Yes, not only that, Sheikh, we have uh, also the reality of, of the times we're living in. Most of the crime is, is committed by youth because of how they view the world. And the young women also, they feel they've been held back from growing up in the sense that when they are mature, when they ha do have uh, feelings of marriage or, or to have intimacy, they've been restricted by a law which the body and the emotions of this individual is, is ready for. Yeah, this is completely true. And again, 
it's our rules that we should apply and practice simply because it's not human made it's divine it's from Allah Allah Almighty created us and he sent us this manual to operate and to tell, tell us how to operate his creations and by applying it we are applying the rule of Allah the Almighty that, that had not changed for the past 15 centuries not even one single letter going back to the army the Prophet had 1,000 men and they were ready to fight an army three times as big and far superior in equipment and armor the Prophet Sallallahu prayed Fajr on Saturday morning and after they prayed Fajr they could see the army of the polytheists they were so close to them so he asked their, his companions if any of them knows a route that could be a shortcut where they can turn around the polytheist army so that their back would be to Medina facing Uhud and the Muslims would their back they'd be to Uhud facing Medina so one of the companions knew a shortcut and they quickly turned around the Mushrikeen army to the, the polytheist army without them realizing to be faced with the Muslims behind them so they turned away and looked at the, uh, uh, the Muslim army as we can see in uh, uh, the map later on the Prophet والسلام, with his army were ready to fight and he instructed 50 of the men as we can see in the map to go to a mountain that is called Aynain, a small hill next to Uhud he ordered 50 of his archers to stay on that mountain and he clearly instructed them not to leave the site at all no matter what happens even if they see birds coming from the sky taking the Muslims away they should not leave their posts until the Prophet sends to them Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so if you look at the plan if you look at the strategy you would find that it is an excellent plan the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took a position though the enemy army came before him he took the best position it was a little bit higher than the enemies his back and his right hand side was were covered by the mountains his back and his left hand side were covered by the mountain and by the archers on the small hill Ainain. and they were ready to fight now just as the Prophet ﷺ was about to reach the area where the battle took place guess what happened one third of the army defected of the Muslim army of the Muslim army yeah. imagine that one third of the army defected and why was that well I believe we have a short break and just after the break inshallah we will tell you what took place. So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. The people are ready to fight and they're full of enthusiasm and encouragement 
they would like to prove themselves worthy of being the servants of Allah. Fifty men were on the archer mountain, which is Ainain, hoping to be able to defend Islam and the Muslims. The remaining were on the battlefield, ready to fight of an army three times as big as theirs. On that spot, one-third of the Muslim army defected. And who would you guess that would be? Hypocrites. The hypocrites. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul took 300 of his men and said, Muhammad, you did not obey me when I told you not to fight outside of Medina. Fight on your own. And he left. The son of a so-and-so could have from the very beginning not gone out with the Prophet ﷺ. But he did this intentionally. He did this so that he would weaken the Muslims once they see one third of their army defecting and retreating. And he wanted to strengthen the army of the polytheists when they see that and they say, now we're four times as big as they are and better equipped. This caused a problem at the very beginning because two tribes of the remaining Muslims had second thoughts, Banu Haritha and Banu Salama from the Ansar. But that was only a thought that crossed their mind. And soon after, Allah Azza wa Jal strengthened their hearts and they decided to fight to the death with the Prophet And this was mentioned also in the Holy Quran and they were supported and strengthened by the will of Allah. Otherwise they would have been with the hypocrites and doomed in hell forever. This was not a surprise, a big surprise to the Prophet ﷺ. On the contrary, this was a gift from Allah. Because in the Battle of Badr, Allah Azza wa Jal showed the people the true value of the polytheists who lost in, and, and, and were defeated. And in the Battle of Uhud, Allah the Almighty showed the people the true value of the hypocrites. And this teaches us that whenever you're doing something for Allah, your front should be solid and pure. You should not allow others with you when they have different agendas and hidden agendas. You all have to work on the same platform. rules, regulations, and platform. You have to share the, the same beliefs. But if you want to defend Islam, and the man next to you wants to gain or wants to have or to score a point or want something politically motivated or uh, uh, economically motivated, then inevitably defeat will take place. This is a very important lesson we learn from this battle of Uhud. The Prophet ﷺ is encouraging his companions. He's telling them that whoever fights with them, facing them, not giving them their back, whoever is patient, exactly as he said in Badr, he will end up in paradise with me. And everybody was looking forward to that honor, to die in the side of Allah, defending the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He took a sword of his, a very strong one, and then said to the people, who would take this but would pay for it? So, Ali advanced, Umar advanced, Az Zubair ibn al-Awwam, they're all strong warriors of Islam. They all wanted to take this sword. The Prophet ﷺ did not give it to any one of them. They were astonished. And he kept on saying, who would take this sword and take it and give it its right? So Abu Dujana, Simak ibn Kharsha, stood up and said, Prophet of Allah, what is this sword's right that you want us to give? He said that you fight 
the polytheist until it breaks and bends. So he said, I'll take it, Prophet of Allah. And he gave it to Abu Dujana. So everybody was eager to begin the fight. On the other side, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, the leader of the polytheist, and by the way, he accepted Islam five years later. May Allah be pleased with him. But at the time, he was a fierce enemy of Allah. And Safwan ibn Umayyah. Excuse me? And Safwan ibn, and Umayyah, Safwan ibn Umayyah ibn Khalaf, the son of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, and also Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl. Abu Jahl, who was killed in the Battle of Badr, his son was Ikrimah, yeah. and Ikrimah also became a good uh, a Muslim after uh, uh, five or six years. But at the time of yeah. Uhud, they were all enemies of Islam. Because you said Safwan ibn Umayyah and Abu, Suf Abu Sufyan, both of them, they were the reason for the battle really to start and collected, you know, the yes, yes, donations. Yes, and yes, that's true. And mm -hmm. they were all enemies of, of, of Allah. Definitely. But they all accepted Islam, subhanAllah, five, six years later. And this also teaches us a lesson that never ever condemn someone and say that he's in hell forever. Because as long as he's breathing, you never know what Allah mm -hmm. may do with him. He may transform and accept Islam in a matter of seconds. Like what happened to Umar himself. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was a fierce enemy of Islam. He used to attack the Muslims in Mecca. And once he took his sword and he went to the hiding place of the Prophet and his companions to kill him. And he was met by one of the Muslims. And he saw sparks coming out of his eyes. He saw this great anger and hatred. And he told him, Umar, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to kill Muhammad. So the man could not stand in his way because he would have killed him in a matter of seconds. So he, he redirected him. He told him, before you kill Muhammad, go and check your sister and her husband because both of them are Muslims. And he was outraged. He went to his sister's house. He went in. He saw her reciting the Quran. And her husband stood up to do something. And he just pushed him and, and he was... Uh, 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 pinned to the floor uh, fainted and he went to his sister and he smashed her on her on her face he slammed her on her face and she cried and she said until when are you gonna stay away from Allah she shouted at him and this was not expected from her so he felt a little bit soft and he told her what is this you're reading she wouldn't tell him when he insisted, she said, this is the Qur'an. So he told her, give it to me, let me read it. She said, no, you're an impure person. You're najis. Go and wash and come. Subhanallah, the guy was there to kill. And he went and he washed and he recited the surah of Taha, ma anzalna alayka al Qur'an And the guy was 180 degrees transformed. And he said, what do I do if I want to become a Muslim? And he became a Muslim. And he went to the hiding place of the Prophet ﷺ. That was less than half an hour. Transformed completely from wanting to kill the Prophet to embracing the Prophet at Islam in front of the Prophet ﷺ. He went into the house. Hamza saw him. The companions saw him. They were afraid. They said, Umar is asking permission to enter. So what should we do? Hamza, a great warrior of Islam, said, let him come in. If he wants something good, he should have it. If he wants something else, we will kill him with his sword. Don't be afraid. I'm, I'm here. Hamza was a brave man. So he went in. And the minute he went in, the Prophet ﷺ grabbed his shirt and shook him. The Prophet wasn't afraid. Omar, isn't it time for you to become a Muslim? Immediately he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. So you never ever know when the guidance of Allah comes to a person. That is why never hope any head of an elementary. And I had that uh, at the other side as well, we can't trust ourselves. Like I can't say about myself, I don't know if I'm paradise, if I'm Muslim, I can't trust myself, where, where will be Jazak my Allah khair, That is exactly the, the, tr the true thing to say. We ourselves cannot guarantee that we will die as Muslims. And that is why we're always hoping and fearing. Mm. We hope that we die as Muslims because whoever die as a Muslim, regardless of what he has done, he'll end up in paradise sooner or later. 
But those who die not Muslims, they will end up in hell no matter what good they did because they did not, did not believe in the oneness of Allah and they did not accept the message of the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah. And this is an important thing for us to learn about. Now, Abu Sufyan was doing the same, was trying to make his army brave and wanting to die. The armies at that time and in medieval times, they used to circle around the flag. The most important thing in the army was flag. the flag. Who, whenever the flag was still up, this meant that the army is fighting. Whenever the flag went down, this meant that the army was defeated. In the Battle of Badr, Al-Nadr ibn al-Harith, and he is from the, 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 the section of the tribe of Banu Abd al-Dar. He was the holder of the flag. And he was taken capture. And he was executed because of what he uh, had done previously. By him giving up the flag, they soon lost the battle and they retreated and uh, fled the battlefield. So Abu Sufyan went and addressed Banu Abd al-Dar. Banu Abd al-Dar and Banu Abd al-Manaf were cousins because they had the same great-great-grandfather. And he told them, Abu Sufyan, listen, Cousins, you saw what your friend did in the Battle of Badr and we lost it. So if you're not man enough to hold the flag, it's okay, tell us, we'll take it from you. This came, of course, as an insult. What are you, you're accusing us of being yellow? Okay. Accusing us of being cowards? <laughs> and they damned him and they cursed him and they told him, we will show you what we will do. What they did? Inshallah, this is what we will know when we meet next time. And until then, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.